Today is uh, March 21, 1995, and we have the privilege of talking with uh, Professor Harold von Hoffa. Uh, Dr. von Hoffa is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of German, uh, former chairman of his department and a dean of the graduate school. As director of the Feuchtwanger Institute for Exile Studies, he has been responsible for bringing to the university the major scholarly library of German novelist Leon Feuchtwanger. Outside the university, Dr. von Hoffa was managing editor of the German Quarterly, the official quarterly of the American Association of Teachers of German. Uh, this was in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, later, uh, Dr. von Hoffa was for 15 years the German advisory editor for Charles Scribner's Sons. Harold, if we may, uh, let's begin with the major scholarly endeavor, which has been your primary work in recent years. Uh, how did you come to be involved with the works of German writers in exile? Uh, Paul, in 1942, a colleague in the Department of German, Ruth Baker Day, whose desk was next to mine, asked me if I had seen a notice in the L.A. Times that lectures in German were being given in 1942 on Wilshire Boulevard. I told her I had not seen it, but I certainly would look into it which I did, and noted that Ludwig Marcuse, whose name was well known to me, was giving a series of lectures on the concept of progress in the 18th century and up to the present day. And then several days later, I attended that lecture, Paul. And uh, who was Ludwig Marcuse? Uh, Ludwig Marcuse was a notable biographer of German literary figures, principally Heinrich Heine, perhaps the most prominent German-Jewish writer of the 19th century and perhaps to the present day. He has also written a number of literary philosophical volumes on cultural history centering in Germany. When I went to the lecture, I noticed among the 40 to 50 persons present, there were a number of writers in exile, Heinrich Mann, the brother of Thomas Mann, Alfred Dublin, the author of Berlin, Alexanderplatz, Alexander Square, and Bruno Frank, who is in German literature, was in German literature that which perhaps Somerset Maugham is in English, a craftsman, elegant style, but uh, somewhat limited substance. But Marcuse was an outstanding critic. How did these people happen to be in Los Angeles? It came about in the following way, Paul. Many of the German exiles who left the Weimar Republic in 1933 or Austria in 1938 when Hitler annexed Austria went to southern France, to Sanary, where was a large colony of German refugees. After the Nazi armies conquered France, most of them went to America. A few to Mexico, most of them to North America. They went to New York and then to Los Angeles. The reason they came to California was the fact that before that time, a number of German moving picture directors, Fritz Lang, Lubitsch, Dieterle, Koster, Preminger, Preminger, if you like, and others had come to L.A., to Hollywood, and here they created the so-called European Film Fund to extend aid to those writers who were not able to pay their way and extend aid in the form of a contract with the studio, even though the directors knew that some of them were not capable of writing move your scenarios, capable of writing brilliant novels, short stories, or plays. But nevertheless, that was the 
open sesame to many of the writers to come here. And as Thomas Mann and Marcuse and Bertolt Brecht, uh, forgive me, it's difficult for me to anglicize the pronunciation <laughs> of Brecht and Thomas Mann and, and others, they acted as a magnet. And so many, most actually, came to Los Angeles, Hollywood, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Pacific Palisades. I'll anglicize them enough. Uh, <laughs> you became well acquainted with Marcuse. Yes. Did, what happened? <laughs> well, in the discussion period, after his first, the first lecture that I attended, at the conclusion, a charming woman came to me and uh, introduced herself as Zasha Marcuse, Ludwig Marcuse's wife, and she said, my husband would like very much to meet you. So she took me to Marcuse, introduced uh, us to one another, and since I had identified myself as an American, it turned out that I was the only American, Native American, who ever had attended Marcuse's lectures. He then asked if we could get together sometime. I said, I would be delighted. And so he asked me to his house in several weeks for dinner and conversation. You kept uh, in touch with him over the years, and uh, later you published his correspondence. Yes. You are in his correspondence. Yes. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, Paul, in 1946, when the University of Southern California experienced a large increase in enrollment, I was able to convince the administration that Ludwig Marcuse would be a very valuable member of the German department. And indeed he was. Uh, indeed, a, a scholar and a writer of international prominence. He was, let's say, somewhat unconventional in appearance. I mean, for example, in a time when, war, when people, men, wore their hair the way you and I do now, he had very long hair, not to his shoulder, but very, very full, I recall him. I remember him in, in uh, <laughs> what we call Founders Hall then. Yes, yes. Well, I recall we were sitting at lunch in a restaurant one day, and several people walked by, and one person jokingly said to Marcuse, are you Einstein? You recall <laughs> Einstein had the same full hair. But aside from that, uh, I would say he was also very unconventional in his literary evaluations. No platitudes ever. He had his own views, his own critical insights. And uh, where did the correspondence that you had with him uh, take place? Well, the, He was in this country or he, back well, in Germany or... Yeah, the correspondence, which uh, came out 25 years ago, uh, Paul, was Marcuse's correspondence with many of the writers, his contemporaries, in this country and in Germany. He returned to Germany frequently for the summer and then wrote regularly to me to record his first impressions of post-war Germany. What were the vestiges of Nazism? What were the new developments culturally, literarily? And I kept all those letters. And then later on, uh, when he returned to Germany in the 60s, permanently after his retirement, uh, I asked if sometime in the future I could edit his letters and publish them, and he said, of course. And so, in his will and testament, he wrote the stipulation that his, all his papers be left to me. And after his death, then, I started to edit the letters. And that made the correspondence. Yes, yeah. Uh, another one of these uh, writers in exile was the novelist Leon Feuchtwanger. Uh, why was he important? Well, he unlike Ludwig Marcuse, was a primarily a novelist. Marcuse was an essayist and a biographer and a writer of critical articles. Leon Feuchtwanger was a writer of novels which in the first half of the 20th century were bestsellers. When in Germany you use the term bestseller, the implication is that they were not worth very much. 
uh, that was not true in the case of Ludwig Marcuse. His Jut Zeus, Jew Zeus in Britain and power in England dealt with an 18th century financier named Jut Zeus Oppenheimer. And he dealt with this figure historically, but molded it as he saw fit. I mean, for example, at the end of the novel, the financier was about to be executed, but he was given the option of becoming a Christian, and then he would not be executed. But Jutzis Oppenheimer chose to remain a Jew. Now, I might add, Paul, that when this was published in Germany, at first it came out in small editions, but as time went on, there were larger and larger editions. At the same time, English translations came out in New York. Because when the novel Jude Zeus first came out in Germany in 1925, a man by the name of Benjamin Hübsch was in Sweden to visit his parents-in-law. Benjamin Hübsch was the son of a Hungarian, Jewish, German-speaking family that had emigrated to America. He, Benjamin Hübsch, was born here, created his own publishing house, and ultimately merged with the Viking Press, became its vice president, and he was particularly fond of publishing German writers in exile, particularly Jewish German writers in exile. I think I read um, Feuchtwanger's novel on Goya. Um, was it an effective uh, book? Yes, I I think I would say it was one of the most effective as far as critical and public acclaim was concerned. It was the third of the three so-called revolution novels. The first was called Waffen für Amerika, that is Arms for America. Arms which, for America. Arms for America, but in actually in English translation it was called Proud Destiny, which Benjamin Hübsch of the Viking press suggested. Incidentally, the suggestion was made by Benjamin Hibbs, who was in New York, to Leon Feuchtmann on, on the telephone. And actually, Leon Feuchtmann thought he heard the word clouded destiny. And he said, well, that's not bad, OK. Because he thought of the last scene when Benjamin Franklin, who had gone to France to enlist France's aid in the American Revolution, walked down the stairs of Versailles, the sun was setting and there was some cloudiness. But to his amazement, to Feuchtwanger's amazement, when the novel came out, it was called Proud Destiny. He said, well, it's even better. <laughs> <laughs> All by accident. Yes. Um, I believe some of these novels have been made into motion pictures. Yes, the Goya novel, which you mentioned, was made into a motion picture in Germany. We have shown it here on campus a number of years ago. That was the third incident of the revolution dramas. The second one was Rousseau, with the subtitle, Tis Folly to be Wise. Yeah. And Goya, this, I mean, the setting in France at the time of the French Revolution, Goya, the repercussions in Spain, as Goya, who originally was a very successful court painter, gradually became a socially conscious painter. And so Feuchtwanger stressed that aspect of Goya's life. Incidentally, there too were problems. I mean, for example, there was a love affair historically with the Duchess of Alba. And Goya had made, had painted two paintings, one the closed Maya, one the naked Maya. And Feuchtwanger insisted that it not be put on the dust cover, because that would mislead readers. Is incidentally, yes, there is a love story, but fundamentally, it is an artist who becomes socially conscious. And so during his lifetime, this portrait of the naked Maya was not used, but later, it has been used. Uh, who owns the um, motion picture rights to um, these novels? The, uh, the University of Southern California owns them. That is, Marta Feuchtwanger owns them after Leon Feuchtwanger's death in 1958. And she, in her will and testament, drawn up on December 3rd, 1977, 
drawn up by Carl Franklin, Vice President Carl Franklin, then legal Vice President, drew up the will which stipulated that her fortune be given to the University of Southern California and the rights to his works, rights to royalties, motion picture, theater, radio income, all go to the University of Southern California. And Martha was kind enough to make me executive of the state and upon the close of probate, manager of the Feuchtwanger estate. How significant is this uh, will for USC? Uh, I must answer that in two parts, Paul. After Leon Feuchtwanger's death, I lobbied with Martha for the library and the magnificent house in Pacific Palisades, the library which contained over 30,000 volumes containing 8,000 first editions and incunabula. She was inclined to give them to us at USC, but also UCLA courted her vigorously. I remember. <laughs> and uh, at that time, I lobbied with her in the course of months, and also my colleague in the German department, Stanley Townsend, who worked with Feuchtwang on English translations, also tr persuaded Martha Feuchtwang to give the library and the building to the University of Southern California. Uh, we want to talk about that library a little more, mm -hmm. but uh, before we do, let's... Uh, explore some of your own scholarly activities. Uh, you wrote six books on Feuchtwanger. Yes. What are they about? Uh, well, I wrote, I, in the six books, there are maybe four or five hundred pages that I wrote. The remaining thousands of pages are previously unpublished correspondence of Leon Feuchtwanger. That is the first two volumes, his correspondence was his close friend Arnold Zweig, who emigrated to Palestine, as, as it was then called in the 1930s, who was well known in Germany and, and for a while well known, particularly for the case of Sergeant Grisha in the Anglo Saxon area of the world. Yes, uh, the name of Arnold Zweig was certainly well known in this country. Yes, I. I, I find they still uh, know Arnold Zweig, good many people. Well, there, was two, there were two volumes, there were almost 500 letters with my annotation, with my introduction and the explications of the allusions in the letters which a lay reader would not understand and some scholars, researchers would not understand. And I found that editing letters takes as much time as writing your own book. Um. Are these published in English or in no, German? No, they're, they're, they're the original German letters. Uh, there is no market commercially, let us say, for them in English translation. What's the impact of these volumes? Uh, who does read them? Well, in Germany, curiously, the two-volume edition of Arnold Spike Lee on Feuchtwanger correspondence sold out. Uh, within several months, and they had to reprint them. Then the next two volumes, and they were also, they printed in Eastern Germany at that time and also in Western Germany in separate editions. Uh, in addition to your uh, uh, works on uh, the writers in exile, uh, Harold, you have uh, written some language textbooks. How did you get into the textbook business? Well, Paul, I recall a conversation I had with you in which you mentioned that when you taught English in Paraguay, you were not satisfied with the text that you used. Similarly, I found that the texts which were available to us in German language were inadequate. I mean, I taught largely in the lower division. At that time at USC, the teaching load was 15 hours. I taught German one five days a week. So I spent many, many hours with students, and as time went on, I uh, developed my own material. At that time, we mimeographed material which supplemented the original. I recall discussing it with uh, Dr. von Kleinsmith at the time, and uh, he was very interested in this sort of thing and asked whether my students in German uh, 
learn German easily or with a great deal of difficulty. Well, in between that, but I said to him, they, I think they could learn the, more, learn the language more efficiently, more effectively, if we had better textbooks. I said, for example, yesterday I received a little essay from a student who had a dialogue in which he was a dog, and he, the person said to the dog, common Z here, that is using the former pronoun Z like vous in French, which you don't use to animals. So Dr. Van Kleinsch at that time, who discussed language and language teaching to me, said, I had an amusing incident last uh, week. I hosted a reception for a dozen students from the Orient. And uh, each one I welcomed and delighted and so on. And I saw one young man with a book in his hand. I, he, Dr. Van Klein, thought it was a phrase book. So when Dr. Van Klein said to him, delighted you, we are very happy to meet you, he said, and I'm very happy to meet you, sir or madam, as the case may be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were these uh, textbooks um, uh, widely read? I wrote, Paul, a number of textbooks, some of which uh, were not widely used, but three were apparently welcomed by both teachers and students. One is called Im Wandel der Jahre, in the course of the changing years. One is called Der Anfang, the beginning, and another one, Die Mittelstufe, the intermediate step. And my thought was that I would use adult mature material for college students, cultural history, dealing with German literature, with German music, with German architecture, with philosophy. Whereas the text was, I was compelled to use when I first came here and dealt with, it seemed to me, nonsensical subjects and had, it seemed to me, ineffective grammatical exercises, uh, filling in endings. That is the house of my old aunt, whom I love very much. And so on. Uh, my own textbooks were built around a core of cultural knowledge. I think all of us that have learned uh, languages on the elementary level have been frustrated by that uh, technical kind of approach. You said you taught 15 hours a week. Yes. Did you get any, uh, any time off for your writing? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I doubt no, it. But uh, most of us taught many hours per week, but uh, it is frequently said, justifiably, that the University of Southern California is so much stronger today than it was in the 1940s. But Ruth Baker Day, whom I mentioned before, yes. was a model for me. She came in the morning. She was in her office at 7 o'clock. She had students in to see her constantly with whom she discussed work in German 1, 2, and 3. I remember Mrs. Day very well. I knew her husband at Occidental College yes. and their twin daughters. Oh, yes. Fine yeah. people. Uh, you also, Harold, uh, did some administrative work. You were chairman of the Department of German. What was the department like in, the, in those days? Well, when I came here, I represented one-third of the German department. Then, with the increase of enrollment in the late 40s, we were able to add Ludwig Marcuse, whom I've mentioned before, and Stanley Townsend and John Waterman in linguistics and philology, uh, all of whom were notable addition to the German department. Then later on, a uh, person like John Spalek, who left us, unfortunately, become chair of German at SUNY, State University of New York in Albany, Jerry Gillespie, who left for Stanford. But here, it was a solid department in addition to being the chairman of the German department and teaching a full load and uh, writing textbooks, uh, you served as interim dean of the graduate school. Uh, what do you remember of that, uh, that period? I was dean of the graduate school in the middle 70s and actually an interim dean. 
because the search committee was looking for a permanent dean. So I simply carried on the policy and made only, let's say, minor recommendations. We couldn't continue to review departments, the graduate program, the publications of faculty members, and uh, the teaching of faculty members, and the students and where they were placed. But I recall at that time, it was already quite obvious to many of us that we had come very far from the 40s, that we had become, a, were becoming a very solid uh, research university. And I recall a comment at one meeting where a faculty member said, yes, we have come a long way, but we have much more to go, so let's work hard so that our football team may be proud of us. <laughs> um, that was 20-some uh, years ago. Uh, In the middle 70s. Do you, um, do you think the university has continued to progress of since course, then? Very much so, measurably so. We are now in many areas among the top 10 in the country and in other areas in the top 20, and uh, we are improving from year to year. How about the German department? Uh, is it a good department now? I, I would say it is stronger today than it has ever been. The members of the department are known nationally and internationally. Oh, for example? Well, Dagmar Brano works on uh, German literature in exile and is very well known in Germany as well as in America. Gerald Frakes in Middle High German, that is the era from about 1050 to 13 when Tristan and Zelda was written, Possible was written. He has gotten out major editions. Uh, Gerald Clausing, who has chaired the department frequently in recent decades, uh, specialized in pedagogical questions and has also become well known. And then Arnold Heitzig and uh, Cornelius Schnauber are on a par with the others among the tenured professors. As I drive up um, University Avenue, I see the Max Kade uh, Center. Uh -huh. What is that? What happens there? Well, uh, Cornelius Schnauber got the, raised the money uh, from the Max Kade Foundation in New York, which has given money to dozens of universities throughout the country, and this one is called a Center for Austrian-German-Swiss Studies, and they have many public events for students and outsiders, the public in general in the area. Uh, does it attract attention to USC? Very much so. Very much to the community in this area and in Southern California in general. Uh, you mentioned a while ago that you were uh, the only American in the in Los Angeles uh, meeting with the the German writers in exile. Uh, what about your own education? Where did you come from? Well, I was born in this country of German parents in uh, in 1912. In 1914, my parents went to Germany to visit my maternal grandparents. And when they were there, World War I broke out. And my father, who had left Germany largely because he did not want to put on a uniform, did not want to take part in military service, immediately said, let's go, immediately. Returned to America, and my grandfather, so I was told, said, twirling his long mustache, oh, that's ridiculous, stay here, we'll be in Paris by... December 1914 will be all over, and then you can return, you know, without any hassle. Well, it turned out to be a little different. So I attended school in Germany, in Berlin, until 1923. And then, we, when, we, then when we returned to this country, the rest of my education was in New Jersey, and then at NYU, and at Northwestern University, where I received my PhD in German. What Since I'd grown up bilingually. What was your uh, dissertation at Northwestern? Perhaps, as I look back, was characteristically on a subject which dealt with Swiss German literature, Gottfried Keller, Swiss oh, yes. German, because I 
felt it was appropriate for me to deal with German literature because of my bilingual background. But then there were the Nazis in control, and it seemed it was not temporary, but more than a few years. And so I chose Swiss German literature. And then later, Paul, when I was in Southern California, I think I started to cling to the writers in exile, particularly when I, we realized that the Nazi regime was so much more horrible than we had even thought in the late 30s and very early 40s. And I recall talking with Marcuse and Leon Feuchtwanger about some books that had appeared in the 1940s, like The Thousand Year Conspiracy that Germans had plotted for a thousand years to conquer the world. Or from Luther to Hitler, these ideas had been dormant, but they had been germinating in German soil. Or the worst, perhaps, a book called Germany Must Perish, in which it is stated that at the end of the war, all German males must be sterilized so that by the end of the 20th century, there would be no more Germans. Hence, there would be no more war in the world, no more aggressiveness, and we would have utopia on Earth. Who wrote this book? Uh, I would prefer not to identify the person. I, I know it, Paul, but perhaps he uh, and his family and his friends would prefer today that the authors not be identified. Well, I shared my experience of reading these books with Marcuse and Feuchtwanger, who incidentally, both Jewish, never wrote anything anti-German, very anti-Nazi in the part of, of Leon Feuchtwanger, the so-called Waiting Room Trilogy, Erfolg, and he wrote in the 1920s, which dealt with the creation of the so-called True German Party. It foreshadowed Hitler. Yes. The man Kutzner is addressed as the Führer in this novel. It appeared in 1930. 1933, Leon Feuchtmann wrote The Uppermanns, the family, a Jewish family in Nazi Germany in the first six months of the Nazi regime. And then uh, later on in the 30s, he wrote a novel called Exil in English and Paris Gazette of the Nazi reaching out toward other countries. But neither he nor Ludwig Marcuse as such never wrote anything anti German, not that they are by nature evil. Well, this I wanted to believe, and talking and being friends with Ludwig Marcuse and Leon Feuchtwanger helped me very much. Now that's a, a wonderful association. To identify, associate with German tradition in an unsullied sense. May I? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> no, I. Uh, of course, many of the exiles were Jewish, not all. Thomas Mann was not Jewish, Heinrich Mann, his brother, was not Jewish, Leonard Frank was not, Bertolt Brecht uh, was not Jewish. But among the prominent Jewish writers were Marcuse and uh, Leon Feuchtwanger, and I experienced and found new knowledge of Judaism, really. For instance, Ludwig Marcuse said, yes, I come from a Jewish family. He said, but he said, I'm no more Jewish than you are. He said, my education in Germany dealt with German philosophy and German literature. I have no sense of Jewishness religiously, ethnically, culturally, but I will continue to be a Jew and identify myself as Jew as long as there are a Jewish problem in the world. Leon Feuchtwanger, on the other hand, used Jewish themes in his novels. In over half of his novels, there are Jewish people and Jewish questions, but in a, in a reformed sense. But he, as his wife Martha, Martha spoke for him after his death when we talked about her memoirs at one time, and she said, I'm Jewish. He said, I'm not proud of being Jewish. He said, are you proud of being non-Jewish? <laughs> he said, similarly, I was born Jewish, so that's the way it is. And I should always be Jewish, but why should one be proud of being this or that? So it was a allegiance to Jewish traditions and cultural history and in, a, in the Reformed Jewish and religiously. Well, those two, I think, 
gave me insight into uh, a prominent, to prominent Jewish people and attitudes in the late 20th century. I believe that the uh, post-war German government has been interested in our institute for exile studies? Yes. Uh, uh, well, I should perhaps distinguish between our institute and that at the Villa Aurora, the Feuchtwanger House. I see. Because a German group bought the house from USC. The Feuchtwangers bought it here in 1943 for $9,000. They bought the house? The house for $9,000. On the market today, it would be worth two and a half to three million dollars, as my wife told me, who has been in real estate for the last 20 years. The university bought it for one million nine. It was a concession on the part of Jim Zumberg and the committee on which I served and worked with Jim Zumberg. But their exile studies will be continued in Pacific Palisades as well as European American relations. And that institute is being supported by the German government. The Bundestag, the parliament in Bonn, has promised contractually to give 500,000 marks a year to operate the institute. That would be about $375,000 according to current currency exchange. Do you have any uh, connection with the institute uh in the old Feuchtwanger house? Uh, I am on the committee. Uh, in Germany, they're called the Freunde und Förder der Villa Aurora. Here, the friends and supporters of the Villa Aurora. And I'm a part of the local group, which is advised, advisory in character. And I correspond with persons in Germany and see representatives or, of the organization when they come to Southern California. I want us to talk some more about the house and the library, but just a couple more questions about yourself. Uh, you're married, you have a family? Yes. Uh, my wife uh, is a former student of mine at the University of Southern California. She was in one of my classes. Uh, she had been a French major, but uh, she became a double major in German and French. Beautiful lady. And uh, we have two sons. The older one, Hal, did his undergraduate work at USC and then got a PhD in Yale in comparative literature. The younger one, Eric, did his undergraduate work at Berkeley and then came to USC to get his PhD in biology, pathology, and is a cancer researcher, cancer specialist. What are they doing now, the sons? Well, Hal is teaching high school, actually, in Connecticut, and uh, by his own preference, for years, been teaching problem classes. That is, youngsters who perhaps, because of their outstanding talent, are problematic or became problematic in high school. They were impatient, wanted to move, uh, or there were those who were less gifted, or there were those who came from broken homes, alcohol, drugs, and so on. So it is a mixed group of people, but apparently from publications of his, from comments when he comes to visit me occasionally, he has found his niche in life, his fulfillment. Eric, on the other hand, uh, went for postdoc in cancer research, in pathology to the University of Zurich in Switzerland, the Institute for Pathology, Institute for Pathology for two years, and there he met Susanna, his Swiss wife, now his wife. He came back and got an appointment at Harvard, but since he did not have a permanent appointment, a tenure appointment, he accepted a number of years ago an offer from Hybridon, a biotech company in which he does cancer research, travels very frequently, and does precisely what he did in the academic world. Interesting indeed. Uh, you've mentioned Marta Feuchtwanger. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting her on a number of occasions and uh, visiting her at uh, um, Aurora, uh, the Feuchtwanger house that you've been talking about. Uh, 
Tell us a little bit about this fantastic lady. Uh, Marta was a very attractive young woman. A swimmer, wasn't she? She went to the ocean every day until she was in her early 80s uh, to swim every day of the year. She, in Germany, had been a tennis player when there were very few women tennis players. Uh, she confided in me that uh, sometimes when men became quite distressed when she beat them, she let them win for the sake of good relations. When Leon Feuchtwanger passed away, after a period of mourning, several years, she became, I should say, the model executor of her husband's works. She started to correspond with publishers, with moving pictures companies, moving picture companies, and uh, it came about that his works came out in larger editions than ever before during his lifetime in the late 70s and 80s. She frequently took groups through the house, members of the German department, I went there very frequently, uh, members from the consulate when German officials came here from Bonn, a must on that to be seen and witnessed in Southern California was the Feuchtwanger House. When I was so, dean of summer session, we used to take our visiting faculty yeah. uh, to see the house and the library, and Marta would serve us uh, refreshments. Yes. Personally. Yes. Well, she she did that with all groups, and she did that, of course, uh, regularly when Feuchtwanger read from his works. Uh, are uh, always the same, but beautifully prepared. What in German called Italienisch has a lot of Italian salad, the ingredients of which I don't know, and then there was Apfelstrudel mit Schlag, that is with a lot of whipped cream, and so on and so on, and discussions among the people who had attended the, uh, the meeting there particularly interested in moving discussion. For example, when Feuchtwanger read from his Rousseau novel, uh, I was asked whether he ever wrote about America. Yes, but not critically or in a good sense of the word, let us say. For instance, in the Rousseau novel, uh, there's a discussion between a Frenchman who was all for the French Revolution and an American an American who pushed for complete equality even in the French possessions in Central America, the blacks. And the Frenchman said, no, no, not wait, no, come, come, come. Let's not be more hasty than your spokesman for freedom in Philadelphia. Uh, are all people in America equal? Do they all have a citizenship? Well, no. So with blacks and so on, I limit viola, haste makes worse. Let's take our time. Maybe a hundred years from now, let us see. Well, there was implicit, this, which was a part of Feuchtwanger's commitment his whole life. Ethnically, religiously, he was a cosmopolitan, as he let Benjamin Franklin say in his American, in his novel about America, toward the end of his life, talking to a fellow American, he said, I live. He let Franklin say, for the time when I might set foot on any country on this planet, north, south, east, and west, and I can say, I'm home. Beautiful. Uh, what was his library like? Uh, it was uh, the most extensive library, quantitatively and qualitatively, the most uh, significant that I've ever seen in private libraries. He wrote historical novels, Paul. Yes. And uh, in the beginning, in Berlin, he went to the library to do his research. He had a PhD from the University of Munich. And he worked as a scholar. But then when Jude Zeus and the Ugly Duchess became bestsellers, he said, Lord, I'll acquire my own sources. And he bought from booksellers in Europe, all over the world, that which he wanted, and accumulated this. But then he became a bibliophile. He became an addict of book collecting. Then he 
found books that, well, had no immediate relevance to what he was writing or going to write, but he wanted to have it. And so he accumulated thousands of books of first editions, which now belong to us, Paul. Belong to USC? USC, yes. Uh, how, how did we happen to get them? <laughs> well, uh, Martha Feuchtwanger uh, gave them, donated them to us a year after Leon Feuchtwanger's death. He did, died in 58, and she donated House and Library to us in 59 with the stipulation that she be permitted to live in the house and keep the books until her demise. And she lived until 1987 when she passed away at the age of 96. But now they belong to us. We are leaving about 23,000 in the villa and 8,000, between 8 and 9,000, the first editions in Cunabula are being stored, are going to be stored and displayed and used in Doheny. Now they're in the East Wing, a temporary building, but we are now renovating the old cinema library, which has moved downstairs, and that will be completed, that work, in July, and then the Feuchtwanger Library and the Feuchtwanger Archive, which has as many documents as there are volumes in the library, about 30,000, will be moved into that new room. Uh, you mentioned in Cunabula. Uh, how many are there? There are 26 in Cunabula. That is books published before 1500. I have used a few pre-Lutheran Bible translations. Luther translated the Bible into German in the 16th century, in the 1520s. Is, of course, our hand set. Yes. And uh, a very memorable work is the so-called Nuremberg Chronix, the Nuremberg Chronicle of 1493, also lavishly illustrated, and uh, numerous other works in the original from the 1400s. Will our new library provide uh, adequate uh, security and climate control yes. for these things? Yes, they are now stored in the east, so-called east wing, and uh, there is climate control, there's humidity and temperature control, and in the new Feuchtwanger room there will, of course, be temperature and humidity control, as there is now in the room for special collections where Victoria Steele, head of special collections, you know, has her office right next to the room where the Feuchtwanger Library will be housed. I remember uh, Marta showing me with pride uh, some uh, French newspapers of the time of the revolution. And yes. it was exciting to yes. turn the pages of Indeed. what was going on. Well, in that's uh, the Le Moniteur de Paris, yes. which was created at the time of the French Revolution, a daily newspaper which was published until 1815. And it was used by Leon Feuchtwanger to supplement books that he used for his revolution dramas, American-French Revolution, because there he had daily news not only about Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and Danton and Robespierre, but also about the daily life of Parisians at the time of the, the price of bread and butter and the daily problems that Frenchmen would encounter. I remember um, uh, Marta being concerned that the library be used. Uh, she was... Uh, very concerned that uh, scholars uh, working on publications and on their dissertations would uh, use the documents uh, in uh, USC's academic development. Are we going to make use of this treasure? Yes. Yes, as Victoria Steele, head of special collections, said, that this is the jewel of the library and it will be made available to scholars. Of course, some of the they're all rare books, but if, if rare permits of a comparative or superlative, there are more rare and most rare books. I mean, for example, the Incunabula, because they will be behind glass. And by special permission, scholars will be able to use those, but you will not be able to walk and just take it in hand and thumb around in that book. But those plans uh, have been formulated in the course of the last two years, Paul. Um, Harold, I remember you and I used to play a good deal of tennis together. Uh, do you do that now? <laughs> no. 
No, Paul, I stopped uh, four and a half years ago. I think I could still run after balls, not as quickly and effectively as I used to when you and I played. But particularly my vision was less good. I felt in the last two years that I played, I have glasses for reading and I have glasses for driving and for moving pictures. But when you play tennis, it's in between. Uh, not close enough to read and not far away enough. I mean, as it comes toward you, and I felt my timing was off. So I stopped playing tennis and now I cycle every morning for five miles, and a standing cycle yeah. for five uh, miles, about 20 minutes or so, and then Lenora and I take a walk in the evening for about 20 minutes, and that's my exercise. And you're keeping up your scholarship? Yes. What are you working on now? Well, last year I finished the manuscript of a new volume of Feuchtwager Correspondence, his correspondence with New York publishers, particularly Benjamin Hübsch, whom I have mentioned, the editor of the Viking Press. And this publication, at least in correspondence, may not be unique, but it is not frequently that you see this type of publication. Benjamin Hübsch knew German, but he did not write it, or he was apprehensive about writing it inadequately. So their correspondence was in English and German. Leon Feuchtwager wrote in German, and Benjamin Hübsch wrote in English. And the unique quality of this book, I guess, is character is that Benjamin Hübsch had to convince his fellow editor that the next volume, the next novel of Leon Feuchtwager be published, so he asked Leonard, tell me about the new novel that you're working on. Tell me about the genesis. How did you get the idea? What is the core? What is the nucleus? What is the significance? And so Feuchtwanger would interpret in two to five pages of the whole novel. This manuscript will be out in the fall of this year. And with great satisfaction, I'm, well, I'm sure. Well, it gives me pleasure, and I continue to work with the same sort of thing. It's been a pleasure to uh, talk with you, Harold, and to uh, uh, help record the work of one of USC's most influential scholars. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul.